side, but immediately to my left is uh, Commissioner Jim Delaney from the Big Ten, and again, he is a person with vision, with, uh, I say, big thoughts, and always talked about as one of the most influential people in intercollegiate athletics, so it's real nice for you to be here. Uh, Mark Silverman from the Big Ten Network, of course, one of the first, or the first uh, all sports, all collegiate sports networks, um, really a pioneer in the media space. We have Julie Kimmins from the NCAA. She's here to talk a lot about their events and their broadcasting strategy. We have Burke Magnus from ESPN, who came up largely on the programming side, or in the, in the uh, I would say, negotiation side, and the relationship side of college, uh, intercollegiate sports, and now has a much bigger role at ESPN, where he's been promoted and handles a lot of the network's deals with all the major leagues. And Ben Sutton from IMG College, who, of course, has rights uh, relationships with so many schools, I think I lost count, but according even here in Michigan on campus. For those of you who were with us last night with Dave Brandon, the athletic director here on campus, a lot of the discussion was on ticket sales. How many here, raise your hand, have, gone, have not gone to a college uh, uh, football game here on campus and you normally would have last year? Raise your hand. How many are going to fewer games? We're seeing some softness in ticket sales, not just here in Ann Arbor, but throughout intercollegiate sports. What do you attribute it to? And what do you do to turn it around, besides win? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of factors um, in, in any uh, effort to you know, bring bodies and eyeballs to an event. I think winning is important. Uh, I, would, I would suggest uh, that we, we have, I think, uh, seven institutions are up a little bit, seven institutions that are down a little bit. Um, there's a lot of uh, passion out east. I, I think there are sellouts. Uh, in the three Big Ten games at Maryland and Rutgers. People are excited about that. They're excited about the Big Ten. Um, but, you know, the size of the venues, if you're going to have a venue that is, you know, really uh, at the size of three or four of ours, uh, well over 100,000, I think winning is important. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But it's also true, right, that the television experience has gotten better. And uh, it's also true that I think people are consuming uh, information and content in smaller pieces. So the length of the event, I think, is an important factor. And then I think, you know, this is uh, probably some, what's cool. You know, people do what's cool. And so I think whether you're in professional sports, college sports, or community sports, you're going to want to have an event that's seen as relevant, cool, uh, what have you, uh, for the people that you're trying to attract. I find it interesting you don't mention pricing. Well, you know, the, the supply and demand and price all matter. But, but I would tell you, my, my experience is if you have powerful allure, if you have the right venue, if you have the right team, um, price becomes le less important. Um, and so we have had growth in pricing on most of our campuses over the last 10 or 15 years. I'll tell you the other thing that I think uh, has affected college attendance is that we went to the 12th game Right. Most, most 12 games were not a, ch a challenging competitive environment. And I think that students, fans, television audiences, everybody has caught on to that. If you go back and look at um, schedules from the 70s and the 60s, you would see a 10 game schedule, you would see seven games in the Big Ten, and you would see three major opponents. So going forward, as we went to 11, Schedules got a little bit more diluted. As we went to 12, they got very diluted. So I, I believe that if you provide, I don't care if they're student millennials or they're you know, boomers or whoever they are, the great games on a regular basis, and if you have success, I, I believe the stadium is full, and I think it could probably manage uh, price. And Dave Brandon looked at you last night when he talked about their matchups and their schedule. Yeah. Because it comes out of your department. It does, and uh, you know we, we've had really three events, like three institutions, two major events. One event was um, Nebraska, and then another event was Rutgers in Maryland. And so as you do that, as you make those changes, we've had I think nine or 11 instances where institutions have gone back to back. So this year it's not a happy circumstance for Michigan, but it's not happy circumstance for Ohio State to go to Penn State, Penn State. So we've had 11 of those. And they're anomalies, 
But if you have an eight game schedule and you do it over a 30 year period and there's no change, you're not going to see that. But whenever you go from uh, 10 members to 11, 11 to 12, and then 12 to 14, you're going to have to make changes because there are other factors other than pure who plays home in a way in a particular sequence. We're trying to get um, a variety of, of objectives met. And to be honest with you, we, we haven't been able to do that. But I think people understand that over time, we'll get into a sequence and it'll work better. Other trends other members of the panel are seeing in terms of student attendance? I don't know if it's necessarily just students. I'd say fans in general. I'm, Jim touched on it. We will always struggle with the battle between servicing the fan in the venue versus the fan at home with our broadcast partners. And I think when we make it such a great experience to sit at home in front of your 60-inch television, you know, with full HD, and you know, we're going to we're going to struggle to get those people in venue unless you give them an experience that is unique and different, behind the scenes access you can't get from sitting at home, and that's obviously. Um, challenging when our partners are trying to show that as well. Question for the audience. How many would prefer to stay at home and watch on their big screen than go to a game? Prefer to stay at home, raise your hand. Go to the game, raise your hand. Oh, that's a, that's a big number. You don't see that. So maybe your premise is not as... Uh, oh, there's right. no premise. <laughs> it was just a, there's I'm a not, premise. <laughs> no, no mistake, there's a premise. Commissioner, they asked me to ask questions. That's how, many of, how, how many of them <laughs> like to go to a game and then go home and watch other games on television? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see, there. That's, that's pretty uh -huh. good. Not everybody now. <laughs> yeah, right. You want to watch ESPN and the Big Ten Network. That's what you yeah. got. You got it. <laughs> right, right. Two, two of the finest. <laughs> ben, you're on, you guys are on campus a lot, Mark, Ben, um, Burke. I mean, anything else to add in terms of what you're seeing in terms of any type of attendance trends? There's definitely a trend, and it's not great um, from the perspective that, that, you know, the, the number of people who attend games. Um, First of all, our sponsors are primarily concerned with people who are between 18 years old and 34 years old, and that's our danger point. Right now, in large part, I mean, college football has never been more popular. You know, and, and, and the reality is the combination of college football and college basketball, uh, only the National Football League is competitive with this. 190 million people are identif self identify as college sports fans compared to 180 million in the NFL. I noticed the NFL took college out of their deck this year in their sales. Uh, presentation. They did? Wow. Well, yeah, there must be a reason. Um, so, I, you know, we do have, and the, and the product, the, the product of college football in particular has never been more popular. We have lightning in a bottle. But 18 to 34, we're, we're not giving them everything that they want. What they want is they want, you know, as, as Jim said, they want lots of snippets of information. When we put them in stadiums where they can't even use their devices, and they don't, you know, no offense, but you're all the age of my daughter and my son. Uh, you know, they don't go 15 minutes without <laughs> going to their device and we put them in a place where they can't use it and then we don't give them content that they feel like they can use when they're in that place. The other things they say to us are, you know, we want more opportunities. I mean, students like to gather, they like to be in social places. I'm a trustee at Wake Forest and when I meet with, with students in, in my work there, um, you knew I had to work in one Wake Forest thing. Uh, you know, they talk about having social gathering spaces and places that they can go and be together. And I don't think we've done a good job of addressing that in, in college uh, arenas or stadium. And, you know, we're really in large part being saved by the baby boomer generation. College football attendance is really not drifting down. We just have, there are a lot more people my age. And, and so that, that generation is bigger than it's ever been in the history of the United States. So the, seat, the seats are still getting full, but we need this crowd. I mean, you saw all those hands go up, and I don't know that I would call it a representative sampling because they all signed up to come to a sports business conference. But um, you, you have to look at that and say, well, there's hope if we just give them what they want to do. And one of the things we're going around, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see Dave actually after this meeting, Dave Brandon, uh, we, we're proud to be associated with this great university. Um, and one of the things we're talking about is, you know, what could we do to make the college football weekend experience more fulfilling? Um, because it, it used to be that people would come to a college town and build their entire weekend around the game and they would kind of make their own fun. Uh, we live in a more programmatic age today. And so, you know, we're talking about now, you know, gosh, should we be doing women's conferences on, what do we do for women? 42% of the people that come through the turnstile at the game tomorrow are women. What do we do for them? You know, should we have Sheryl Sandberg come in and do a women's conference on Friday afternoon? Should we have a concert on Friday night 
have a food and wine festival, you know, that goes on all day Saturday and then a game on Saturday night and really fill up the entire weekend and make it an experience that it, it, it really wouldn't be fitting not to top it off by going to the game. Um, I think we have to think about things a lot differently. Eric Hyman at, at, at Texas A&M has got a program now where they actually, uh, students come in and, uh, you know, Damon Evans has this little company fan gauge and they measure when they go in the game and they measure when they go out of the game. They earn points and then they earn rewards. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some people may say, well, that's crazy. You shouldn't have to incent people to come and stay. But, uh, you know, I mean, he wants that 12th man advantage that's always existed at Texas A&M. He didn't want to look up in the third quarter and see 14,000 of his 20,000 seat student section empty. Yeah, I, I, I just think at the end of the day, if you put on a competitive team, you do well, you have a competitive schedule, people are going to come. And I, and I think, you know, the scheduling, you know, Jim alluded to it, it's going to have a direct impact. If, if it's a 20, 30 point spread game, um, you know, I think the allure of the game is damaged. And in, if you're going to play tough competition and you're, and you're going to do well, I think, you know, Wi-Fi helps. I think the events help. But it's sort of band-aids in a way. If you're not going to be able to put a team on the field, you're, you're going to get the school behind and feel really proud about going. I mean, you know, going to college football games when I was in college was among the things you most enjoy of anything. And I think you have to be able to provide that level of an excitement for students for, uh, to be able to capture you know, the interest. The, these are all the issues. I mean, these guys have mentioned them all. It's strength of schedule. It's, it's uh, the in-stadium experience. It's connectivity. It's programming the weekend. It's, you know, I think the one thing I would say is I think a certain places, um, uh, you know, we're just behind, we're behind the curve on anticipating this trend, right, which was really easy to do when you had, you know, uh, when, you, when you didn't see this offense coming and you didn't, you know, uh, potentially anticipate the problem. And now uh, there's a lot of catch up being done. But there's a lot of creative thought being put into it and a lot of talented people and a lot of, and a lot of innovative firms that are, that are working on the issue because there is an issue. And what we try to do at ESPN is, is contribute in, in, as a broadcast partner, contribute in any way we can to help, particularly the in-stadium experience, right? Because the, the last thing college football fans want is to have to detach themselves from the rest of the sport while they're in watching their team, right? So it's, it's programming the video board, it's the connectivity issues. It's, you, you wanna know what's going on, particularly now in the playoff era, where it's as much about, you know, uh, you know when there's many, many more teams that seemingly are, have, have an interest in, in, uh, in the competitive aspect of, of qualifying for the playoff. So it's, all, it's everything everybody mentioned, and, and it's top of mind, there's no doubt. So for this audience, quick show of hands. You heard them all. For you, what's most important? Raise your hand after each one. Strength of schedule? The, the competitive nature of the team, Wi-Fi and technology uh, access, access within the venue. Interesting. Not very, not very strong response to that. Not for Wi-Fi. But, you, but, you, but schools are spending a lot of money on DAS systems and Wi-Fi. I, that's I because they, you want, they want a winning team with Wi-Fi. Right, winning team with Wi-Fi <laughs> is the takeaway. W's. Uh, yeah, W's. Right. W's. And it's, it's easier to say Wi-Fi, right? I, I just think if you're a program, it's much harder to turn around a team and really have a top, top, nationally ranked program. There's not many of them. They're, you know, they're by definition, there's top 10. Yeah. Um, across the spectrum, it's really difficult to be able to do that, and it's a lot, I think, easier to think about, okay, let's outfit, or, not that it's easy, because it's costly with Wi-Fi, you know, not everyone could be a top 10 school all the time, and they, it is very cyclical, and you have ups and downs, and, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's just very difficult in a highly competitive age um, to be able to field a team that can consistently be a top 10 program. You know, it, it's about, I call it competitive disruption. And, you know, in the NFL and in Major League Baseball, they have mechanisms. They have revenue sharing. They have the draft. They have a variety of mechanisms intended to keep everybody hopeful and engaged. And you can look at basketball or baseball or the NFL. NFL is created so everybody could be eight and eight. And so Belichick gets ahead of the curve. And, you know, he seems to be able to, to, to stay ahead of it. But most franchises go up and down. College sports a little bit different. We don't have a draft, you know, we don't have a salary cap. We have scholarships and we have a series of rules that are intended to keep as many in the game as, as possible. 
those rules are under tremendous attack. Right. They're seen as concerted action to um, undermine you know, one uh, student athletes or favorable to coaches or favorable to schools. So those rules are intended to provide as much competitive equity. And maybe we've gone too far in that area, but, but I would tell you that at each institution, and this goes to the issue of the millennial versus the, you know, the boomer, they have a set of expectations. Michigan's expectations are really not tied to the 20s and 30s. They're tied to the 70s and 80s and 90s, okay? Because the people who were there, there in the 20s and 30s, I mean, they're not here anymore. They're not with us. But the, but the boomers are the people who are there in the 70s and 80s, and most of the championships during a period of time were won by Michigan and Ohio State. So that's the institutional expectation. So all of a sudden, you get the spread. Okay, then you get demographic change. Then you get coaches who are ahead in one way or another. Then you get explosion of television. We used to have one game on TV in the 70s and 80s. Now we have all games on TVs. So you have these factors that influence competition. And I think that there's a level of disruption. So the Yankees have won 28 or 29 World Series. The, the St. Louis Cardinals are second, I think, with 13. Okay, then everybody else may have one or two or six or seven. So if you look at Southern Cal, if you look at Notre Dame, if you look at Texas, if you look at Alabama, they have all had ups and downs. You know, Michigan went from 1985, they lost uh, to BYU the year BYU won the championship. I think they went 30 years without well, winning fewer than eight games. Without winning, yeah, fewer than eight games. So they had this high level of consistency, though they get a coach change, they get this, they get that. So you get disruption. And so I think that the disruption in some ways has effect on attendance, okay? You know, and, and so you have every sport needs rules. Every sport needs a way to keep as many people in the game as possible, to have hope, and to have a sense of competition. We've had nine different teams go to the Rose Bowl in, in my 25 years, okay? We've had probably more competitive environment than the previous 25 or 50 years. And so that's gonna create there's the same number of wins every year. H half win, half lose By inside definition. of Big Ten. But how those are allocated has a tendency to affect institutional expectations. And I would say at Michigan and Ohio State coming out of the 70s and 80s, those expectations were the highest. Northwestern's expectations, they had the nation's longest losing streak. So when they go to the Rose Bowl or when they start winning seven or eight or nine games, it's gonna buoy them in a way that, it, that seven, eight, or nine is not gonna boy Michigan or Ohio State because of the expectations of success. And so I call that competitive disruptions impact on fan bases. I think the only rule, I agree with you, the only rule I think in our career that, it, that, it, that has done anything like what you referenced in the pros was going to 85 scholarships in football. Yeah. That, was the first, that was the first time that um, you know, the Wake Forest of the world or the Northwesterns of the world. Well, it wasn't just 85. It was 95 to 85. Before it was 95, it was 105. And before it was 105, it was unlimited. Yeah, unlimited. So yeah. we've gone from unlimited to 105. I think maybe even there was a 120 in there, a 105, right. a 95, and an 85. So that spreads talent. But the other thing that the game used to be played in a little box. Mm -hmm. Now it's played out here and out here. Mm -hmm. So that means the ball's in the air. So that means there's more variability. Right. And you, and you get outcomes that are different. The athletes are better, the coaches are better, and their talent is more spread. So that is gonna affect institutional consistency in terms of what it was in the 70s and 80s. In fact, we did a study one time in uh, the 70s and 80s and the 90s. Um, we thought our officiating was getting worse. A lot of people probably thought it was. But in effect, the games were getting closer. So the champions against the spread against the rest were maybe like set an average of 17 points in the 80s, maybe 10 points in the 90s, and in some years as few as four points. And so as games get closer, mistakes stand out more, whether they're players, coaches, or officials. So things are popular because things are, because there's a lot of parity and there's a lot of, uh, but that's discontinuous for people who are in institutions expecting to win 10 games every single year. Right. Oklahoma, Florida, those are pretty good programs. Miami, mm -hmm. Notre Dame, Southern Cal, UCLA, Michigan, Ohio State have all run into periods of time when they're uneven. And that creates a lot of problems and I think that it's probably more important than Wi-Fi. <laughs>
now you see how lucky you are to be in this room because I think everyone would agree when you sit with Commissioner Delaney on a panel, you're just getting not only insight, but also a great look at history. So a little point there. I want to get to something you said, Commissioner Delaney, in terms of the threats on the system. And I want to be delicate considering mm -hmm. we're on a college campus. But raise your hand if you think that the institution of the NCAA and intercollegiate athletics needs to change. How many, uh, I got, okay, I want to be careful. All right, so let's talk about, let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about some of the things you mentioned, because even Dave Brandon said last night, he's, you know, there are nine active lawsuits. He's out there trying to budget for the next five to 10 years and it's impossible to do. There's the autonomy issue that will, drip, I think, be driven by conferences in terms of moving the, balls, moving the ball forward. There are you know, issues with player compensation. Walk the students and the panel and, and the audience through a little bit of you know, where we're going with this and where you see it potentially ending up. I, I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna let okay. some others. Anybody who's comfortable, because I know this is a delicate issue and not people can talk much. Unfortunately, I think this is Jim's section, so. <laughs> it, it, it probably is. It will not have to volley it right I mean, just, just <laughs> I'll talk very generally. I, I, I think, you know, when you, you're talking about change, cha change comes gradually, and, and I think um, while this may be, get, we might be getting to this as an industry slower than would have been optimal, um, I take, you know, encouragement that things are moving in a direction where um, things will be more equitable for student athletes. Injuries are going to be taken care of better. Scholarships are going to be honored more. You know, whether or not it's, you know, what the specifics are, you know, I know Commissioner Delaney spends a lot of time with the other commissioners and working towards making that. But I think, I think what we should look at is that the, you know, the voices are being heard and the changes are being made. And whether you could argue it's because of the lawsuits or because of the unionization issues at Northwestern, I, I don't know if that's really that relevant. I think the good news is the, the, you know, the words and, and the updates are on their way. Things are getting, I think, definitively in a better place. We have a college football playoff. People have been complaining for many years, why is there no playoff? You know, ESPN will be televising that later this year. Um, the rights for student athletes are gonna be increased significantly from what they've been. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of negativity. I think we live in a very negative world. Um, in, in a lot of respects, you know, due to, due to social media and, and things like that. And, that. and that's the world we live in, and, and that's fine. But I think there's not enough recognition of the balls moving in the right way. Things may never be optimal for everybody's point of view, and never, you're never going to please everyone. But I don't know. I, I, I look at the way things are changing, and, and I applaud the direction, and we'll see what the specifics are. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with how... I'm viewing things going from, from where we are today. I think, I think there is a sweet spot, and, and you know, you, we, could, we could put it in front of this group and, and see uh, you know, by a raising of hands, but I, I do believe that there is a sweet spot that if we could achieve, we could get uh, a far stronger sense that the deal is a square deal, okay? Because we, we know that you know, Michigan is unique, Notre Dame is unique, Alabama is unique, in the sense they're pretty successful programs. True. They're very successful programs over a long period of time. They can develop resources. Michigan's unique. It has you know, broad opportunities for men and women. It's unique in the sense that it's expensive. So, so it costs. Nobody wants to pay for it, but the fact of it is it does cost. I think most people don't really believe in pay for play for athletes, but I think they do believe that the scholarship should be more inclusive that it should manage miscellaneous expenses. So whether you come from a wealthy family or whether you come here on scholarship, you should be able to get a pizza and you should be able to take care of the basic living expenses. I think we're heading in that direction. For all athletes. Yes, for all, all I don't yeah. think that they would say it's only right. For football and basketball. basketball. I, I would guess how many people think that only football and basketball players should have a full robust financial aid package as against everybody else? Should everybody have it? Or should just football and basketball have it? Raise your hand. Should everybody have it? Should just football and basketball have it? So, so I, that tells me something. They think that the grant and aid should be broader than it is. Now, I think there's some people can afford it. Some people cannot afford it. So the question then comes: If you can't, ha if you don't have enough for everyone, is it okay to reduce the number of athletes that you serve? So, would you rather have? Um, everybody taken care of, but a smaller number of everybody, or would you rather have 
uh, a broader everybody with a lower benefit. I, I would think, because Michigan is 31 sports, but Indiana maybe have 25, and Northwestern maybe have 18. Is it appropriate to manage this in a way that the, the experiences are high quality for a fewer number or more modest for a larger number? Who would think the more larger number versus smaller number of high quality? That's a tough decision. It's a tough question. Nobody wants to cut sports or cut opportunities. But when resources are finite, nobody wants to pay an additional amount. We want to do it through the gate and through television. So my point is, is that for competitive reasons, we have the one-year scholarship. Who believes in four-year scholarships? Four-year scholarships? Yeah. Right. Who believes in one-year scholarships? Nobody. So we're heading towards four-year scholarships. Who believes that if a student leaves early to go to graduate school, excuse, I mean, at least school early to become professional, so. that they should be able to come back on the school's dime and finish their degree? How many people? Lifetime would, scholarships. Okay. You guys, That's the direction we're heading. Who, who thinks it's not, not appropriate to support people after they leave? Not okay. Not so we're going to four-year scholarships. We're going the cost of education, and we're going to return. If we're able to do those kinds of things, in other words, take care of men and women athletes on an equal basis, provide a grant and aid that's for the full cost of education, give a four-year scholarship so no one loses, and also return a person. How, how many people think that would be a, a, a far fairer deal and something that make the system more acceptable? Steps in the right direction? Raise your hand. OK. So we have work to do. And I think when we do this, we're in a better position to defend the collegiate experience. I think until we do that, there's a lot to be critical of. And so um, I, I take, I think a lot of the litigation is about eliminating all rules. I think some of the litigation is about unionization. I think some of the litigation really is about moving in a direction that what we wouldn't be able to sustain for a broad group of people, simply would not. So what, what I see is a 10 year you know, period of time, like a lot of people think we're in the bottom of the eighth, I, I think we're in the bottom of the second. Wow. In terms of the changes. Yeah, because it's going to take three to five years to get these cases through the Supreme Court. Okay? The schools themselves don't change overnight. It'll take two or three years for us to get all these pieces together. And then, to the extent that the courts do or do not support what we're trying to do, then you're, these are not constitutional issues. These are labor law, antitrust law, and Title IX law. And Congress will then have a final say as to whether or not the institution of intercollegiate athletics, higher education and athletics, is, is it, if it's recognizable, we go forward. If it's not recognizable and not sustainable, then there'll be, um, people will weigh in on a national public policy basis. And, and so I, th I think we've been rigid. I don't think we've evolved. I think we'll need more evolution than what we've had to date. But I think if we get there, that there's broad support for a fair and square deal for students who are full-time and kids who graduate and get the benefit of the, of, the, of the collegiate experience. I think it's there, but I don't think we've gotten our house in order to deliver what it is that we're capable of delivering. So basically, it's an issue that you all will be dealing with and actively engaged in if Commissioner Delaney is correct in saying that it extends into a number of years ahead. I don't want to dwell on some of the issues there because we want to keep moving. I think Mark hit on a point, one of the biggest stories in sports business, in college sports, is the advent of a college football playoff. I know you didn't come here thinking you had to think so much, but one more raising of their hand. <laughs> How many like the college football playoff? Raise your hand. How many would prefer to stay with the old system? Burke, you can't raise your hand. <laughs> I, I like it. All right, so obviously here a big hit. People are excited about this. Burke, why don't you start us off in terms of giving the broad strokes. We've got two kind of semifinal uh, games in early January, and then a finals the Monday thereafter. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, in, in a lot of ways, it's the development of the playoff is a microcosm of what, of what Jim was talking about in terms of how the, lead, the, you know, the stewards of intercollegiate athletics responded and evolved to something that was very much uh, the pulse of the fans, right? And, and, they, and they did so in a way that you know, uh, lived into the priorities that they set relative to the collegiate model and, not, and, and the uh, importance of the regular season and, and uh, you know, presidential uh, uh, approval was necessarily all, all along the way, so it wasn't just a bunch of, 
you know, of the college football people deciding what they wanted to do. It very much fit into the entire enterprise. And I think what they've created is something that has a chance to be really, really special for a long time. Um, you know, uh, some of the elements that we like from a media perspective are, you know, are the way it was um, constructed relative to New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. There'll be six games played over those two days, triple headers both days. Uh, it, inf it includes the existing bowl system. And so the big brand name bowls are all going to be a part of it. And they're going to rotate the semifinals through these six games. And there's going to be a championship game uh, after that. And, uh, you know, the way it responded to fan demand, um, um, again, maybe it took a little bit longer than some people would have preferred. But, um, you know, we, we, for one, were not, were not uh, I don't think we shared necessarily, with the exception of a few of our commentators, uh, did not share the, the opinion that the BCS was you know, sort of irreparably uh, damaged or bad, right? I thought the BCS did an excellent job doing what it was constructed to do. And I think people lost sight of the fact of why the BCS was created. It was created to put number one and number two together. And if you look at the history of the BCS, it largely did that almost without exception. And uh, the problem was is that people felt like that wasn't enough. More teams are deserving. I think this regular season is proving that out you know, from the first moment. Uh, and it's going to be incredibly compelling uh, for the sport. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, it, it was an interesting process for us because it was really being invented uh, and uh, negotiated at the same time, uh, which, was, which was interesting. I hesitate to use the word fun because right. those things are never <laughs> All fun, but you know, as a fan of the sport, you know, I think where they where where they ended up, where the commissioners ended up, where the presidents ended up, is a is, you know has a, like I said has a chance to be really really special for the whole panel. It could be pretty transformative in terms of viewing habits, in terms of holiday experiences, in terms of the strength of college football, right? And yeah, I, mean, I think this is um, we were talking a little earlier, and, and this is something that benefits everybody. Um, you know, we we don't. We're not going to have the college football playoff, but we, our guys are talking about it every day on the air. And, and as is ESPN and as is every other sports network and sports radio, the amount of attention college football is generating as a whole on every campus that's a relevant campus is greater than it had been. Um, the playoff has just brought a lot more attention. It creates content for, for networks that need content. I'm sure it, it has sponsors more interested in what's going on in the sport. It just grows the overall interest. And, and any time you could have something like that, it's, it is a special occasion. And, and it is something that I think you're not even really going to see all of the benefits that this is bringing um, across many campuses. And we'll see you on Tuesday when the first you know, listings come out. If we think we've been talking about it a lot now, wait till you start seeing you know, where those teams are rated, one through you know, 25. Um, it's going to be a whole, no whole nother level beyond what we've seen so far of interest and attention. And that helps grow the sport. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's beneficial across the board. 7.30 PM on ESPN, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> For those taking notes. I thought this was a plug for <laughs> you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. I, I would just echo that, you know, like Mark mentioned, there's a lot of excitement around it. I think we see it as a great opportunity. You know, March Madness is obviously something very special. Um, there's always opportunity to grow and do things better, and I, I think we will certainly look at the college football playoff as what worked really well for them and what, you know, do we need to consider doing. And, and conversely, I think there's some learnings from how we've been successful with March Madness and, and that they will likely mirror echo. I, I think one of the things that we, everybody should acknowledge and think about is college football has the greatest regular season. And it has had the greatest regular season for decades and decades. And maybe the postseason was inadequate. It grew to be inadequate. The bowl system was uh, arcane, and, and they couldn't match up one and two, and the public wanted it. So we got it. Uh, we got there. And uh, it was controversial, but very successful. It was a bridge to sort of where we are now. But in getting to where we are now, you know, the, the North Star was the protection of the 11 or 12 games that we have, making them as important as they have always been. Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Alabama, Auburn, UCLA, Southern Cal. There, there, there are only going to be three playoff games. There are hundreds of regular season games. And that's the foundational piece of not only college sports, but the funding of college sports. 
and the traditions. And so we had to protect that. It had to be ensure that we could protect it. We also have very critical relationships that go back more than 100 years, the Rose Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, the Orange Bowl. So we had to figure out a way to, to not abandon that, to make that tradition part of the new tradition. And then the last thing is, we need, we, you know, everybody loves uh, quantitative information, but we needed to make this more human. And so we have all the data, but we're gonna have a, more, a, face, a human face on it that is more transparent and can give the explanation. It will be successful, make no doubt about it. It will be doubly controversial. It will be as controversial as the BCS was in its own way. So the controversy will not end. It will just be beginning, which will then drive sort of more interest and more desire to grow. But remember, in growing and responding to the controversy, we have to protect the regular season. We have to protect the history and tradition of the game. And you just can't go too far in one direction too quickly and leave behind basically your touchstones, which I think are the experience of the athlete. These are students. We were just talking about it. They are full-time students. We, are, we, we play 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. We have to have that in mind. This is college football. Just to echo one thing that Jim said, and, and I'm, I, I think it's going to be really controversial too. I'm hopeful that this is what I would call you know, healthy controversy, as opposed to at the end of the BCS, I thought it was unhealthy controversy. Unhealthy. What's the difference? <laughs> Seriously, what is the difference? I, I, listen, I think you know, the well was poisoned on, on the BCS. At, at one point, the critics turned um, into a sort of irrational, unhealthy criticism, right? I, I think they lost, I'm not saying they were wrong, I'm just saying they lost sight of, of, of what the BCS was, why it was created, and what its, what its positive impacts were gonna be to, uh, almost to a fall, right? And it, and, it, and it started to seep into, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but it started to seep into the regular season, and it started to seep into the fabric of the sport itself. The postseason was so bad that college football was bad, and, and I think they fixed that, and I think the contra controversy is not always bad. I think controversy can be fun and healthy and, you know, and can help and be a driver, right? And, and I think that's what it's going to be for the playoffs. Well, I mean, to, to Burke's point, it, it's not healthy when Congress concerns itself well, who gets with it? who's one and who's two. I mean, <laughs> we've got some big problems in this country, yeah. and I guess the BCS would merited that. But there were several, <laughs> there were several, there, was, and the, the, there were lawyers in Utah, right. attorney generals in Utah, there, you know, there was lots of uh, interesting articles written. We, we never even intended for the BCS, which probably is not a great acronym, the Bowl Championship Series, to become a brand, it became a brand. You heard uh, within two years, oh, it's a BCS school, it's a BCS conference. Right. What, what is a BCS conference? We just simply said, the, uh, a team from the Big Ten, if it's ranked one or two, could go play in a one-two game. We, we didn't join the BCS. That was a, that was a creation of Maybe. either television or branders or advertisers. We just wanted to give a one-two opportunity within the context of a bowl system, and we wanted the regular season to be maintained. We ended up in Congress. We ended up being sued for this reason and that reason. We were accused of conspiring. All we were trying to do was create a one-two game. That was all. And let me tell you, it just got to the point. We did it for a long period of time, but um, you know, it, it evolved into the four-team playoff, and that's exciting. But it's going to be, and and so I, I think it's a, there's a difference between having a difference of opinion on who's four and five, and an assessment that someone is involved in a conspiracy against somebody else. That's probably not too healthy. Thank you. He just defined. If controversy, de if controversy <laughs> derives change, he mentioned a four-team playoff. How long does it become? An eight-team playoff. This is college right? football. So you're saying it should stay at four. Regular season is important. I am simply That's saying I believe in evolution. Who's to say we've got 12 years, we were at 16 years. Who knows where it's going? The basketball tournament at one time was eight teams. It stuck at 28 or 32 for a long time. It went to 48. Then it, went, it found 64, and it found a resting place. It's got a good natural rhythm. Some people want to take it to 100. We said, please don't do that. Mm -hmm. You've already had a, a dramatic negative effect 
on the, on the regular season, where people don't even look at the games in the same way. It's all about seeding. So don't do that to college football. You know, I'm not saying um, that this is the panacea or there wouldn't be change, but let's live this and let's give this a chance and just recognize the law of unintended consequences is always at play. So if you have the responsibility for charting a course, you need to understand what you're doing. You need to understand it's college football. You need to understand it's been a one semester sport. You need to understand these are a lot of football games. And you need to understand that there's a lot of tradition involved here too. So there's a, a lot that's being weighed and it's not automatic that when your team doesn't get to go, the answer is expansion. Gotcha. He makes a really good point about the state of college basketball. We could talk as a segue to that to move on the conversation. How do you make the college basketball regular season a little bit more engaging? At, at, at the risk, Big Ten basketball attendance has grown five years in a row, five years in a row, and our television ratings have grown four years in a row. So ours is- Your television ratings have grown four years in a row? Yes, regular they, season, Big Ten? Yes, as, oh. and our attendance, we had 101 sellouts last year. I think University of Michigan, I heard John Beeline say this, you know, I didn't, didn't do the facts check on it, but he said in three years he hasn't played in front of anything other than a sellout crowd. But you do make the point that- But it's, that's not the case every place in the country. Right, that's all I'm saying. Any thoughts on, I mean, Julie, and you're about events and you're about increasing the exposure yeah. on these events. I mean, I think we recognize the importance of preserving the regular season and how that's all lead into obviously the greatest, you know, championship with the men's basketball championship, but it is all about the regular season and we're focusing more on that this year. I don't think that we have figured out just yet, but I think we realize the importance of, of looking to that to sort of set the foundation for everything else. Anybody else? How about some audience questions? Anybody have a question from the audience? If you do, raise your hand. There's, got, there's one, a gentleman in the back. If we have a microphone, we can uh, take them around. I thought they said they had a roaming mic. And um, yeah, here, here, they got one coming. Go ahead. I just had a question with this panel specifically um, with regard to economic reform. There's a massive media rights sponsor, or, or a massive media rights deals signed as of late across sports. Do you think those numbers can sustain, or do you think there be maybe a bubble on the horizon? Good question. He's talking about major media rights deals impacting all professional sports and college sports. NBA a couple weeks ago signed a $24 billion deal. ESPN was part of that. Um, are we in a bubble? Or yes, I think they're going to go down considerably. <laughs> right. uh, you paid for everything. Amen, the only one left Amen, is this bro. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who tweeted that? I hope someone did. That's all right. you. Listen, I mean, the value of live sports rights are paramount. It, 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 you know, it, that, that increase is not driven by anything other than market forces like everything else. Um, you know, it's incredibly valuable content, whether it's us, whether it's Mark's uh, network, um, those same kind of rights applied you know, to Ben's business as well, you know, be they radio, be they uh, digital. I mean, it's, there's, there's, uh, there's, it's just the, it's the one, uh, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse because a lot of you guys know this and you've heard it, but it's the one thing that cuts through with viewers. It's, it's, you must watch it live if you're a, if you're a serious fan. And you know, that drives, um, you know, that drives the, the marketplace. And, and as much as I'd like to say, I mean, listen, we always do what we believe are, I mean, these are deals we believe in, right? The, the, the approach at ESPN is uh, even when, you know, there's an, there's an increase uh, in fees, it's to get as much content as we can, uh, and get as many rights as we can across platforms. We don't do television deals. They're, they're, uh, they're very broad, and they give us uh, a, a fighting chance to build businesses uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 make a, and make a profit. So it's, it's, a, it's been an incredible run. Um, you know, I think Jim will tell you there's one more deal out there uh, to, to do, and he's, he's probably right. Um, but... Uh, but that's because there's inherent value in the product. And, that's, and the marketplace, and it's as competitive a marketplace as it's ever been for sports media rights. And I, I just, I, I see that continuing. Yeah, I think if you're a valuable property with the amount of competition there is out there today, you know, I think, I think the, the relative importance of sports and an incre increasingly splintered world of attention and programming and, 
you, you, there's very few things that drive the audiences that live sports programming does. And that's only going to increase going forward as audiences continue to get even more splintered than today. The one thing that's holding together are sports ratings of you know, higher quality content. So, you know, I think there, generally speaking of a bubble doesn't really work when you have a variety of various types of content that are worth a variety of different types of value. You know, some content might not be worth in the future what it is today. But when you look at properties like the Big Ten, like the NBA deal that just got done, certain properties are so rare to come by. You know, when you look out at the horizon and you see a Big Ten content coming available, there's not much else you can look at that's similar to what the Big Ten content is like. So when you have that kind of exclusivity over um, a wide swath of, of interest in sports and, and territories, I, I think the value is in a really good place of, of you know, um, keeping and growing um, in, in the future. So I, I, don't, I don't see that you know, coming to be. Remember, that, you know, Jim and I are old enough to remember this, but I mean, 10 years ago, they were asking us the same question on panels. 20 years ago, they were asking us the same question on panels. Boy, can this be sustained? Can it continue to go? And then you look at things like you know, three highest cable television programs in the history of cable television, not sports, in the history of cable television are BCS national championship games. The, on, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you had to work to go find a college football game on Saturday night, uh, you, you know, anywhere besides ESPN. And now college football is the number one show in primetime, 11 or 12 Saturdays in a 14-week season. I mean, that it, I go back, I mean, we have lightning in a bottle. The interest and the passion and the desire for content around this product has never been greater. So until that wanes, you know, then it's, it's hard to see how this, you know, goes backwards, as much as Burke and I would both like for it to. That's I mean, a good jumping off point. I know there's another question, so if we can get the microphone to the next question, I'll ask it. But what other sports, because you talk about the college football, and we're talking about college basketball, what other sports could realistically see traction and growth and appeal? I mean, you have it on your network, you started the SEC network. Julie, you see this. Are there other college sports that really could be the next big thing? I think the College World Series has shown tremendous growth over the last few years. College World Series? Yeah. So our baseball championship just has done very well. I think there's a lot of potential there. I think some of our women's sports have seen really good growth in the past few years as well. Women's volleyball, we were talking about this last night, that there's more of a demand for that. Certainly the ratings are up, which is great. Um, the coverage is up, which really helps with the growth. The exposure is huge, so it's always going to propel us further. So you like college uh, World Series baseball, of course, and then you said women's volleyball. You I think some, those are two some. great growth what, opportunities. What other growth opportunities? In, in our business, I mean, it's, it's you know, we, we've seen great growth in baseball, and I'm a baseball guy, so I, I, I mean, I, I think there are very few events in America that are as great as the College World Series. It's really a terrific event. Um, but, in certain, but, but, our, but our baseball business is, is growing and booming for us in certain regions of the country, but in other regions it might be lacrosse. Um, I mean, lacrosse. What regions for baseball, south or? South and southwest right. and west coast. Right. Um, and you know, whereas in the northeast, you know, lacrosse has just taken up. We actually, we broadcast games on radio in lacrosse now. If you'd asked me 20 years ago, is there any way that would have ever happened, I would have said, no way. But it's. I mean, it's, it, it's probably the fastest growing sport in the country now. That's, that's a sport we're, we're really invested in. Um, Across? Yeah, and, and I know they're, they're going to add a, they're adding a varsity program here. The Big Ten uh, you know, went from not having a league to having, in my opinion, one of the top lacrosse leagues now uh, with the addition of, of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. Um, we, we're putting the most resources behind uh, spring sports because you know, that's a season for us where the content is more valuable, right? So baseball, softball, and lacrosse are our primary focus in the spring, mostly because we have the shelf space for it, right? It, as much as I like things like women's volleyball, it comes at a time where, you know, we, it's hard for us to put our shoulder behind it in a meaningful way. Um, not to say that we, I mean, we like we, the, the winter, and, the fall and winter sports are just harder for us to program. Spring sports easier, so we're going to put our emphasis there and see what comes of it. I'm not sure anything that we discussed is sort of a far is a long way from from football, certainly, right. or, or, or even men's or women's basketball. But right. yeah. um, that's that's where our that's where our focus is. Yeah, on. I think Abe just following up on these on these guys. Like it's it's 
you know, the aggregate, you have, you have geographically, nothing really measures to football and basketball across the spectrum. But you have very popular sports in different pockets, whether it's in the South uh, with baseball, like even within, specifically within the Big Ten, we have in you know, some of our markets, wrestling is really huge. Okay. Other markets, hockey is really huge. Right. Other markets, women's volleyballs. So it's not so much that there's a consistent sport across all of them, but aggregately, if you add in the different pockets of interest, you do get up to it. It's not necessarily a key third sport, right. but it's a variety of sports that add up to being an, an important third element. I mean, I think that's one them. of the reasons that the Big Ten Network you know, was able to get traction, get distribution, get followership, get viewership, was because of the relationship between the, the schools and the rivalries and the markets and the commitment to broad-based sports. So you, you're going to get tremendous reaction to hockey in certain markets, mm -hmm. tremendous reaction. And, and then people in Columbus care about what's going on in Detroit. I mean, they talk to each other. Those markets talk to each other. So between the multiplicity of the sports offerings, men and women, the history and tradition of the rivalries, and the fact that 50 years after we came into being in the 1890s, Major League Baseball and the NBA and the NFL all established central divisions over the top of Big Ten markets. So a Vikings fan is sort of a Minnesota fan. A Green Bay fan is a Wisconsin fan. A Bears fan and Illinois share the same colors. Papa Bear Hallis and, and Red Grange. And so you see this interconnectedness of markets and teams and fan bases that sort of allows, uh, allows for a network like the Big Ten Network or ESPN to capture not only a sport in a season, but a series of fan bases and a series of sports and a series of activities because the, these things are related. They're, the umbrella is college and university, but then the markets and then the fact that everybody has broad-based programs. And I will tell you this, that the women's volleyball and the hockey and I think the lacrosse are going to continue to grow. And to Burke's point, the need for it is a little bit less in prime time on Saturday night in the fall, but there's definitely windows of opportunity that you know the Big Ten Network and ESPN and other entities can see here because these are really energetic, engaging, um, you know, visual uh, presentations of sport. I want to get to some of the audience questions. I believe we have one up here with a microphone. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I have a question for all the panelists, but I'll understand if you can't comment in depth. Um, Commissioner Delaney, you had mentioned that we're in the second inning right now in terms of reforms in college athletics. And um, if the legal system upholds the designation that some student athletes are employees, could you folks comment, on, or I'm sorry, that they're employees, can you folks comment on how that changes the landscape of college athletics as well as your business, whatever comments you can make. You know, if, if that's where the courts end up, first of all, we're you know, a country of laws and not a people, so the law is the law, and you sort of respond to that uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. First of all, you respect the judgment, and we've got some judgments that um, are preliminary, um, but, but you respect them while they're in effect, you appeal them, just as, to me, individuals have a right to bring a lawsuit and redress grievances against the government or private parties, so, so do people have a right to defend themselves. But you go through a process, and it's going to take some time to do that. And as I noted earlier, these are not, in my view, civil rights issues. They are not human rights issues. They're about allocation of resources. And if a person is, is viewed as an employee, they have to be treated as an employee. That's simply what the law would require. But I would also tell you that the intercollegiate athletic educational experience is very unique, doesn't exist in Europe, doesn't exist in Asia or Africa. It, it's very American. And I would say that ultimately, the people of the country will have an opportunity to express how they feel about this through Congress. And so I believe that we do everything we can do to make it as good as we can make it, and we have work to do in that area. That's probably two or three years. The court cases are four to six years before things get through the Supreme Court. And then there's going to be a period of, 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 of looking at it. Is it recognizable? Is it sustainable? Can we work with it? Some schools may say, no, no, we can't. We don't, you're not, the court doesn't require you 
to have intercollegiate athletics. The Ivies have their judgment. Division three has its judgment. Some people may be more than happy to deal with athletes and, and um, as employees. Mm -hmm. Some may not. Mm -hmm. And so you, what you have is sort of a unified division one. You may have other people making other choices and decisions, but my point is, is it, it's early in the game. Um, you have the judicial system, you have administrative systems, you have NCA systems, and at the end of the day, uh, the American people are gonna get what they want. And if that's what they want, that's what they'll get, and if they feel like it needs to be changed or amended in order for it to work for a lot of universities, then that's what will happen. When it was viewed that women weren't provided the right set of opportunities, Title IX came into play. And was, if, if it's viewed that we're not being fair to students, uh, there are systems for resolving that. They're not necessarily TV pundits, they have their opinion, but eventually you have, you have institutions like the courts and Congress and state legislatures who define that. And that, I think that's what, I, what, that's what I mean by being in the second inning. It's, it's a 10 year repositioning and, and obviously uh, there's gonna be some change, but I think it's early rather than late in, this, in the process. Another question from the audience in the top row. Once again, uh, thank you guys for joining us today. And um, this is maybe a bit biased given uh, Dave Brandon, but um, my real question is, what is the role of a major Division I athletic director in the sense that it's easy to be critical of Dave Brandon for you know all the concussion issues with Shane Morris and uh, the ticket policies with both football and basketball, as well as the uh, Brandon Gibbons sexual assault investigation. However, it's not easy to be critical of his bottom line and the fact that uh, the what he's done with our football program pretty much sustains our athletic department. So I'm curious if you guys believe that it's possible to be an athletic director in the sense that you can put the student and student athlete first, or is that somewhat compromised by the need to, you know, sustain a whole athletic department on the back of just one or two programs in football or basketball? Good question. And specifically, since we don't have an athletic director, we have different perspective. So thoughts on that? I mean, my, my, my view, job. my view, it's a, a very it's a very challenging job. Right. I think, I think Dave, as a former student athlete, as a former CEO, as a regent, and as somebody who loves this university, has the skill sets. But I will tell you, it's, it's a complicated environment. And you have 900, I think, 31 student athletes. You have a hundred and million dollar plus enterprise. And I, I would simply, I would simply say that the athletic director um, as compared with the coach or the athlete is sort of behind the scenes, uh, but is responsible for developing the resources necessary to provide uh, a collegiate experience for a lot of men and a lot of women. And uh, I don't think anybody is prepared to write a check, stroke a check. It's an independent operation. It's got business elements to it, but there's no doubt about it. I think Dave and every athletic director in the Big Ten would agree that the educational and health welfare, social welfare of the athlete is always number one. You never compromise it. Are there mistakes made? There were. I think they, uh, Michigan acknowledged there were uh, mistakes made. They were viewed nationally. They weren't done intentionally. There were mistakes made. We're in a new world of, of, of health and safety, and um, we're going to have to make, we've made some progress. We're going to have to make some more progress, and families and students are going to have to make choices about what's the safest way for them to use their free time. Sports have um, depending upon the sport, certain inherent risks. And we've got to do everything we can. And the, the Big Ten, I think, has been energetic in this area. We're working with the Ivies to do some of the best and, and, and foremost epidemiological research. We're getting baseline testing. We're gathering the history of the athlete as they come to our school. And then we're going to give them the best uh, medical training and or the medical support and athletic training we can. But it's at the beginning of the process and um, I've talked to a lot of people at the NCAA and at the NFL. We need, again, we, we've, got, we've got room to grow and room, room to get better and we're gonna make mistakes, but I think it's a safer place than it was a year ago or two years ago or five years ago and it's gonna have to even become safer. And to his question, in terms of skill sets for an athletic director, and what attributes, I asked him last night, Dave Brandon, like, what attributes do you individuals see that ADs really need to have today? He said thick skin. <laughs> He's I think that's true. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, if you're an athletic director, uh, to go back, go back to Jim's thing, if you're an athletic director at a BCS school, 
Um, the, you know, that, that is, it is a very complex job. There's so many different, I worked on a college campus for 10 years. Every day, yeah. And there's so many different competing constituencies and, and missions and agenda uh, on a college campus. And so uh, you've got to be skillful in dealing with your faculty. You've got to be skillful in, in dealing with and raising funds from your uh, alums and, and the people who care about your program. Um, you know, to, to, I mean, I think everybody here agrees. I, I don't know an athletic director who doesn't put first and foremost the, the health well being of the, of the student athlete is there, you know, on any description of their day, that's the first thing. That's what they wake up thinking about. And at night, that's what wakes them up. And, and so, I mean, they're, they're just really complicated jobs. One of the things that I, I find that's really interesting in America, though, is that. In sports and politics, when, when somebody makes a mistake that's in the public glare, the immediate, and this is a phenomenon of the last 10 or 15 years, the public outcry, for, you know, for the scalp immediate, immediately is, is absolutely remarkable to me. We had a situation a couple years ago with a, a guy on our, uh, one of our broadcasts who said something he wished he hadn't said, and you could probably all figure out where he was. And, the next day, there were articles in newspapers saying, you know, that we had to get rid of the guy. He had to go, and and um, you know, I I tell my children and coach and trying to coach them up about life. You know, all of my best life lessons are rooted in failures I experienced. You know, I mean, you you only learn lessons when you do screw up. And so this idea that that somebody would make um, a, a judgment that was different than yours and they therefore, by definition, have to go. You see it. In, you see it with, you know, secretaries of state, and secretaries of defense. You see it in politics all the time, and now it pervades our business. is really quite ludicrous. And so, you know, wherever you it's fall down, it's going to continue, though, Ben. It's not. No, gonna it stop. is going to. It is right. going to continue. Um, you know, be, because guys like you employ people who want to write those stories. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, who wants to come work for me, right? I do. I do. So, um, you know, but it, it's it's. I, I do think people need to take a breath. But I think it goes back to to Burke. The quality of the criticism should be inspected as much as the act that's being criticized. Correct. So it's fine to be skeptical. If someone earns um, that, you know, you don't want to be Pollyanna about any of this. Mm -hmm. These are competing uh, priorities. You, you can't have money compete with welfare. Welfare is one, but money's necessary to provide the opportunity. That needs to be managed. You need the skill set. And you may delegate how the money is, is raised and developed, but you can't delegate the responsibility to balance the budget. You can delegate health and safety to an, a doctor, but you can't dodge the responsibility for the execution of that policy. So the person at the top, whether they're an AD, a commissioner, a president, a CEO, has the ultimate responsibility for everything that happens on their watch. Sure. So the, 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 the deal is, is there an isolated act or is, the, uh, is there just rank uh, uh, lack of concern for, for welfare? And what I see happening because it's the reporting is sometimes about who's first, not necessarily the best report, you get a rush. You get a rush of judgment, not rush to judgment, but a rush of judgment in, in the environment that we're in and, and sometimes it, it doesn't stand up over time. It just simply doesn't stand up over time. But we're in a world of global instant communication. People are, love their sports, love their teams, love their athletes, and that's all good for us. But the other side of the coin is sometimes the reporting and the lens through which the public sees the act is, is, is maybe not have perspective. A lot of times you don't see an act for what it is until you have a little perspective and a couple of different viewpoints. And I think we're in a place where we've kind of gone from skeptical to cynical to very quick judgment. And I think that's probably you know, not going to change. I think you have to live and prepare as if that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make you more forthcoming. It tends to make you more reticent. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it makes transparency more difficult right. because the judgments are so 
instantaneous and the results are viewed in that way. We need to finish up. I'm told it's the last question. I apologize to those who I didn't get questions to. They'll be around if you want to speak to them. Uh, one word answers, because I had promised this uh, student body I'd ask this. One word advice to these young people if they want to develop a career in the sports business. One word? word. It's got to be very brief. Resilience. Resilience, very good. Internship. <laughs> very good. Uh, really? Persistence. Burke. Flexibility. And Ben, you get the last word. I, I mean, it really experience. Just kind of mirroring what Mark said. Yep. All right, I, that was a great panel, great discussion. I think we're going to turn it over to Chantel. Or Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.